got message it is it is getting live stream live meeting got it Is being... I have that fifteen second uh, only. Uh, yeah, it is, it is all right. It is all right. It's all right. Working live on YouTube. It's showing there. Yeah, Lakshmi ji, we can see that yes. we are we are on live. Yeah, we can start. Yeah. Yeah. May I start now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, please yeah. proceed. Okay. Good evening and namaskar to all the participants of the webinar on World Ecological Day on behalf of South Asia. Showing can go to sites. Pleasure to extend. Yeah, yeah, there's so oh, well, welcome to all the participants to this webinar. Sir, some of you are you open YouTube, YouTube simultaneously. You have to close that window of YouTube. Oh, my sir. Yeah. Muted. Yes, sir. Please go home. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so once again, good evening and namaskar to all the participants. Uh, uh, on behalf of South Asian Meteorological Association, I extend heartiest welcome to each one of you and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm also grateful to our keynote speaker. Dr. Gulam Rasul Sahib for having agreed to deliver talk on an important topic that is restoration of Himalayan ecosystem. Uh, he is a former director general of Pakistan Meteorological Department, currently manager with program manager with the EC mode. Thank you so much, Rasul Sahib. Uh, we are also happy to have uh, panelists from our member countries from Himalayan region. Today we have a uh, Mr. Naseem Muradi, head of the forecast division of Afghanistan Met Department. We are very happy to have Dr. Atik Rahman Sahab, Executive Director of Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies. Thank you so much, sir. We have our colleague, Mr. Singe Dorji from Bhutan Meteorological Services, the Chief of Weather and Climate Division of National Center for Hydrology and Meteorology. We are waiting, I think, for Dr. Professor A.P. Dimri, who will be joining us as a panelist. He's from the School of Environment Sciences, JNU, New Delhi. We have uh, Dr. Sarla Kaling, who is a regional director of Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment. Uh, also, we'll be joined by the Dr. Arun Bhakti regional program manager from EC Mode and Dr. Atikur Rahman, uh, who is the water and climate change expert and member of the National Climate Change Council of Pakistan. So I am thankful to each one of you. We are happy and delighted to have Professor Rajesh Kumar, Dean School of Earth Sciences and Head Department of Environmental Sciences, Central University of Rajasthan, Jaipur, for moderating the panel discussion. We have with us uh, the advisory council member, uh, Dr. Sam Samrinder Karmakar. So thank you so much, sir, joining us. And natural ecosystems have evolved over the long period of time and lived in harmony with uh, uh, the people. The ecosystem supported living organism, biodiversity, and provided natural resources for the economic development. In the last two centuries, industrialization and exponential growth of the population has led to increasing demand on ecosystem resources. In the recent decades, environmental impacts of the anthropogenic actions are becoming significant. Common features responsible for causing degradation of all types of ecosystems are climate change, environmental pollution, unsustainable exploitation of natural, natural resources, and lo le loss of biodiversity. Humanity's hunger for resources has pushed many ecosystems to the breaking point. As per World Economic Forum, around 1.9 million square kilometers of undisturbed ecosystems have been lost in the last two decades. The area of primary forest worldwide has decreased by over 80 million hectares since 1990 as per food and agriculture organization. Soil erosion 
and other forms of degradation degradation are costing the world more than 6 trillion us dollars in loss of food production and other ecosystem services approximately 30% of natural fresh water ecosystems have di- disappeared since 1970 habitat degradation is endangering animal species we are witnessing the extinction of many of such the live example is british columbia of the of the canada which because of the heat wave in the last week of june has lost more than 1 billion of sea creatures because of high temperatures recognizing the importance of ecosystem and harm caused by its degradation urgency to restore ecosystem has been realized the un has designed the 2020 the decade as the decade of ecosystem restoration it is a joint initiative of unep and F- a food and agriculture organization of the united nations is calling for the protection and revival of the ecosystems all around the world for the benefit of people and nature un has planned restoration of 350 million hectares of the degraded terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems restoration could generate us 9 trillion dollars of ecosystem services and also remove 13 to 26 gigatons of the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere the economic benefits of such interventions exceed nine times the cost of investment when elections is going to cost much more humanity ecosystem is of vital importance to the well-being of the more than 2 billion populations of himalayan countries and downstream it is a fragile ecosystem has witnessed degradation and will face brunt of the climate change therefore task of preserving and restoring himalayan ecosystem needs to be taken on priority it calls for awareness among policy makers scientific community and general public today's webinar is an attempt in, in this direction we we'll look forward for the valuable inputs from the experts and take this initiative forward once again thank you for your participation and look for a very thank you so much thank you thank you very much elio uh, dr thai saab for the welcome address uh, we have got now many prominent uh, participants of this webinar i could see dr ali sheikh saab also he has joined from pakistan so welcome dr sheikh um i now like to request dr fatima akhtar to introduce to our speaker dr gulam rasul saab She has lost connection. I think, sir, there is some internet connectivity issue or some connectivity problem. Just a few minutes. She was there. we got about 23 people now so i can see now professor chalise from nepal namaskar sir <laughs> yeah your mic is mute um dr patimax after so i think uh, net problem is still going on uh, she is supposed to introduce our main speaker dr gulam rasul uh, good afternoon everybody Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. If it is taking time, then I can introduce the speaker. Just few seconds. We will wait few few minutes. mon did you contact she still has a problem yeah yeah i yeah dr shahad i am talking with her yeah okay you talking to her okay
sir uh, she is trying to join with uh, her mobile data i think she will able to join soon okay these are the problems of the internet webinar suddenly some network is off <laughs> and then we have to wait for few minutes is dr golam rasul already there yes yes then we might as well start i mean uh, well, introduction everybody knows golam rasul or we can well, let me then uh, if it is taking time for dr fatima I'll quickly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gulam Rasool. Yeah. Uh, formally, although uh, he is well known uh, to all of us. Uh, well, Dr. Gulam Rasool is presently serving at uh, International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, UCMO, as Regional Program Manager. By qualification, he is a meteorologist, and he has served Pakistan Meteorological Department. for 32 years um, at various positions and retired as veteran general of veteran general before assuming present assignment dr rasool is the recipient of young scientist and senior scientist awards in meteorological research in 1993 and 2007 respectively he has served as vice president of wmo ra2 and worked hard to promote cooperation among the regional member countries with the wmo dr rasool has served as regional coordinator in climate services for agriculture he is author of two books and more than 100 research papers ranging from weather phenomena to climate change issues of south asian region so so i mean we know dr rasool but there are many audiences here who may not be familiar with him so i just thought that it is good to have a formal introduction of dr kumar so sir So, sir, now the platform is with you, and you can start the talk. Dr. Gulam Rasool, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Das, Honorable uh, Professor uh, Ajit Tiagi, President of SAMA, distinguished uh, scientists, members of uh, SAMA family, and uh, invited uh, panelists. Very good. Uh, evening namaste and assalamu alaikum i will uh, i will talk about uh, asian high mountains which are commonly known as uh, third pole let me share my screen with you yes okay so it works can you see please yes yes you can see all right so i will be talking about uh, himalaya hindu kush uh, region which uh, together with the tibet plateau is uh, commonly known as third pole and third pole uh, we are the beneficiaries of uh, third pole because uh, third pole is not only the as uh, natural asset this is uh, a great uh, mover of uh, our uh, weather systems also i flash my presentation outline i will first uh, focus upon the importance of uh, ecosystem of uh, third pole this is satellite picture which is showing uh, this region and uh, this region has uh, three famous uh, mountain ranges himalayas karakoram and uh, hindukush together with the uh, tibet plateau which is a uh, playing very important role and uh, this is uh, known as uh, global asset for food energy water carbon and is house of uh, cultural and biological diversity 
There are 10 major river systems uh, which are emerging from uh, this uh, HKH region, eight, uh, serving eight member countries. 240 million people in mountainous region uh, are directly benefiting from uh, the natural resources of HKH and uh, 1.65 billion people downstream are benefiting from uh, the water resources and other natural resources of HKH region. So in total, almost uh, 2 billion people's, people of uh, this area are the beneficiaries. Biodiversity is uh, very important uh, of, in this region. This is fourth uh, biodiversity hotspot in the world. If we look at uh, its assets uh, during the decade of 1998 to 2008, on an average, uh, 35 new species were discovered each year in Eastern Himalayas. So uh, this is not uh, the end of uh, the study. Study is going on and monitoring is going on, but this is just an example to reflect uh, how important uh, this region is and how, this is, uh, how much this is uh, unexplored. 70 to 80 percent of uh, original habitat in biodiversity hotspots of HKH has already been lost. And uh, there are uh, projections that one fourth of endemic species in Indian Himalaya could be wiped out by the end of this century. 60 to 85 percent rural population in HKH uh, are directly or indirectly benefiting from these uh, natural resources. This is a highly populous, populous uh, area because uh, there are uh, river basins uh, which are uh, sustaining life in this area. But unfortunately, decisions uh, made about uh, these mountains are always uh, outside of these mount mountains and uh, people from these mountain are uh, never been involved in those decision makings. There are more than uh, 1,000 languages spoken in this region. This is uh, the linguistic biodiversity. This is uh, very important uh, uh, for uh, the whole global community because uh, if something wrong uh, happens here, then it will affect uh, one fourth of humanity. In addition to that, I would like to emphasize on uh, the meteorological and uh, climatological significance of this region, because uh, this third pole is uh, the major driver of uh, monsoon dynamics uh, in South Asian region and also affecting the tracks of uh, westerlies which are producing solid and liquid uh, precipitations, mostly in winter season. In early 80s, uh, eight member countries, they joined together and uh, they formed an international center for integrated mountain development, which is supposed to be a knowledge platform, learning platform and enabling uh, center for sustainable mountain development and for the mountain people in HKH region. You all know about uh, the rugged uh, uh, terrain features uh, of this area, therefore uh, observation networks are poor. And uh, these were uh, very well reflected in AR4 in 2007 and uh, when AR5 in 2014 uh, was published, that also reflected the data gaps uh, of this region. Then the efforts started and uh, EC mode uh, took on board all the eight member countries and decided to conduct uh, a detailed study 
on natural resources assessment in Hindu Kush Himalayas. So that journey started here in 2015. Many scientists from the region and uh, out of the region participated uh, in that, uh, in that uh, studies. And then those studies were, uh, were synthesized and uh, put in one report. I will uh, share with you some of uh, the results of uh, that study. For example, on uh, poverty, Poverty is a major issue of this uh, region. And in mountainous uh, areas, poverty level is uh, much more as compared to the national averages. National averages at present are about uh, 25%, but uh, mountain averages uh, are around 33, 34%. There are uh, various regions, uh, uh, reasons that uh, blanket approach uh, to country level uh, poverty are not sufficient. They are not uh, addressing uh, the issues of mountain communities. There, are, there is a acute shortage of uh, mountain specific uh, poverty data. Drivers of vulnerability and poverty in the HKH region, they overlap uh, substantially and there are uh, also conflicts and ethnic, ethnicity based uh, discrimination, which are the main drivers of poverty in this region, along with the uh, gender dimension. This is uh, largely food insecure area 30, 30% uh, population is food insecure, 50% population is suffering from malnutrition. And one fifth to one half uh, of children below age of uh, five years, they are uh, suffering from stunted growth. Agriculture and food production uh, systems are highly dependent uh, on climate change. Uh, they are suffering from climate change. And traditional uh, food systems are uh, replaced by rice and wheat cropping system. There are uh, low returns from uh, agriculture produce. If we look at the statistics of uh, this region on stunted growth uh, of children under five, you can see uh, uh, that uh, national average is uh, reflected uh, in red bars and uh, mountain areas by blue bars. And you can see in all the cases uh, except uh, Bhutan, blue bars are leading. So this reflects uh, how, uh, how uh, food insecure and uh, stunted uh, growth uh, of children are the serious concerns in uh, Montus region. Now on energy poverty, there are uh, huge resources, uh, huge potential of uh, hydropower in that region. Uh, according to the very careful estimates, uh, 500 gigawatt uh, is the hydropower potential of that uh, region, but 80% uh, uh, population in HKH region, they are deprived of uh, clean energy for cooking. This is, uh, uh, this is a diagram showing uh, availability of uh, electricity which is uh, considerably uh, good, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is progressing well. But uh, on the other other hand, access to clean fuels and uh, latest uh, technologies for cooking uh, in that area there is uh, still uh, there is still uh, a lack of uh, will. Where uh, a lot of uh, efforts should be should be done, especially through uh, nature-based based solutions. There is a high rate of out-migration from this uh, mountainous region. Labor migration contributes significantly to power reduc uh, poverty reduction in HKH region, but depends on who is able to move 
and uh, under what conditions. If uh, you look at uh, this bar diagram, this shows uh, this shows uh, the remittances uh, which are uh, percentage of uh, GDP. Nepal is uh, number one around 30%, followed by uh, around 6% uh, Bangladesh and likewise uh, Pakistan. So th th this is, uh, uh, th uh, there, is uh, there are uh, huge resources coming in. Migration can promote uh, resilience to climate change, but investment in agriculture or climate adaptation, uh, adaptation is rarely the first priority of migrants, uh, migrant households in mountainous region. So these are, uh, these are the issues of out-migration. When out-migration out takes place, men are, uh, men are leaving uh, that region uh, in the search of uh, livelihood and uh, women, elderly and uh, children are left behind and they are uh, most vulnerable to the vagaries of uh, climate change. There are uh, serious threats uh, to the global assets uh, of HKH. The Paris Agreement uh, was uh, signed off uh, in 2015 and uh, global community agreed to limit uh, the temperature increase at the global level to two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius. If uh, global average temperature increases by 1.5 degrees Celsius, it is still very hot for HKH region. For example, uh, in 1.5 degree world, HKH region will be warmed up more than uh, two degrees Celsius. And uh, under RCP 4.5 scenarios, HKH region will be, will be heated up uh, 2.5 degrees Celsius with uh, 1.5 uh, plus minus uh, deviation. And there are very serious concerns uh, if current uh, emission trends continues which uh, follows uh, RCP 8.5 usually. In that case, uh, temperature in this region will increase by four to seven degrees Celsius by the end of the century. What will happen to our cryosphere, which is uh, a great uh, asset under uh, this global warming? Under 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, one third of the glaciers uh, will be wiped off. And uh, under current emission scenarios, uh, two third of the glacier, our ice volume, water volume will be spilled away. And snow, snow cover, snow volumes uh, will decrease uh, gradually and snow lines will be going up. Snow melt uh, induced runoff uh, will peak uh, early in early summer and uh, that will be stronger. Already communities uh, living in glaciated areas are suffering. This is photo from Ladakh, India. So this is showing uh, uh, drought conditions uh, in this valley. Climate change will ultimately affect water resources of this region in the form of loss of storage from ice and greater impact will be felt by the communities living near the glaciers. Precipitation will be following highly erratic behavior between the two extremes, wet and dry that will uh, increase uh, the uncertainty in sustainable development. Springs are also uh, uh, dried up in some areas, but uh, there is uh, a limited evidence on that. EC uh, scientists are already working on it and uh, I hope uh, soon new results will come up. 
in river flows, uh, industry will be suffering a lot. First, uh, there will be an increase in uh, river flow, and uh, then it will decline sharply. After uh, the mid, mid of this century, Ganges and Brahmaputra will be uh, are expected to uh, receive uh, liquid precipitation more. Therefore, uh, runoff uh, will be increasing uh, in those two cases. Air pollution is a big problem of uh, this uh, mountainous area where uh, already pollution levels are higher than uh, WHO recommendations. So air pollution uh, is uh, indigenous and also coming uh, from the surrounding uh, areas, which is increasing uh, temperatures and accelerating uh, the snow and glacier melt. That uh, there is uh, an evidence that there, uh, this uh, pollution is uh, affecting uh, monsoon circulation and its uh, geographic uh, distribution in this area, there are uh, negative impacts on health and uh, also a crop yield in uh, these marginal areas. Disasters, you know, they are connected with climate change uh, and their frequency is increasing uh, over the time. Floods, drought, uh, floods, drought uh, landslides and glacial lake outbursts are common floods uh, of the mountainous region of HKH and one third of the disasters are from uh, uh, flood and most of uh, these floods are transboundary. More than 1 billion people are uh, exposed to this risk and uh, women are uh, more sus uh, susceptible uh, to these natural, natural disasters uh, than men. If we look at uh, these uh, bars, uh, they are showing uh, data for three decades from 1981. So they are, uh, they are in fact telling a story about uh, the economic classes, affectees, casualties, and number of events. All these numbers are increasing with uh, the passage of time. So this is uh, quite alarming uh, for uh, this region. Now moving to the international, about uh, this decade, this decade is very important uh, on global agenda because uh, this is uh, the decade uh, of restoration of ecosystems declared by United Nations Environment Program. Professor Tyagi uh, shed uh, some light on it. I will not uh, repeat it, but uh, there are uh, many initiatives uh, which will be supporting uh, uh, this uh, 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 this uh, declaration. There are uh, there are ambitious uh, efforts uh, on the way to achieve SDGs. These SDGs are interconnected. They are not uh, isolated in terms. They are uh, although they are uh, seventeen in number, but. Uh, there are uh, very close uh, interactions like uh, zero hunger, like poverty, like food security. They are uh, very well connected. If uh, you improve uh, on one side, others will automatically be improved. The global community is making concerted efforts uh, to achieve these uh, SDGs and uh, monitoring of SDGs uh, is uh, the continuous process and uh, at uh, present uh, progress uh, is seen that uh, is encouraging one. Implementation of pa Paris uh, Climate Agreement, you know, after 2015, uh, when global community agreed uh, to reduce the emissions to curtail uh, the global warming, there, there were many hopes, but unfortunately, there was some uh, events of uh, global politics which uh, hindered that pro uh, process, but uh, still hopes are uh, there. Now, again, uh, global community is uh, joining hands. Uh, next, uh, COP26 is coming up, and there are a uh, lot of hopes, 
And uh, I think uh, some uh, pathways will be determined how to achieve that goal, which is uh, in front of uh, all of us. Because uh, they, this is not the only region which is suffering from uh, vagaries of climate change. The uh, whole world is uh, suffering. You can, uh, you can recall uh, just uh, uh, one month ago, there were uh, um, uh, severe heat waves in Europe and Canada. And uh, now there, there is uh, historic flooding in Europe. So th this is not uh, limited uh, to our area. This is, uh, th this is shaking the uh, whole of the world. Then biodiversity conservation uh, is a serious thought of this, uh, uh, of this uh, decade. And uh, we in this region, we should uh, make best use of uh, these uh, initiatives. And there are uh, several ongoing efforts uh, I would like to mention like uh, Himalaya calling. There was uh, Sagarmata summit uh, scheduled, uh, but uh, unfortunately due to COVID onset, that uh, summit uh, has been postponed. I believe that will happen and uh, that will give a strong message uh, from HKS region, uh, how important this uh, ecosystem is with uh, global ecosystems. So that, uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, there is uh, re, uh, reforestation and afforestation uh, uh, move, uh, especially in Pakistan. And uh, I, will, uh, I will share some of the results uh, of that afforestation uh, efforts. But uh, at uh, EC mode, uh, when uh, this uh, report, uh, assessment report came in, that was focused in fact uh, to sustain mountain environments and improve livelihoods in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. We came up with uh, six urgent actions. First one, uh, cooperate at all levels across HKH region for uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable and mutual benefits take accelerated actions to achieve uh, the SDGs and uh, nine mountain priorities, recognize and prioritize the uniqueness of HKH mountain people, promote uh, regional data and information sharing, science and uh, knowledge uh, for cooperation. This is a win-win situation. If there are uh, some good practices being uh, uh, successful in uh, any in any country in this region. So those should be shared with uh, other countries. And also there are uh, enhanced ecosystem resilience. That is, uh, that is the dream. That is the dream message uh, of uh, call to action that uh, ecosystem resilience uh, should be enhanced through uh, nature-based solutions and halt biodiversity losses and land degradation in this uh, region. There are glaring examples of uh, uh, organic uh, sikkim and uh, Bhutan uh, carbon neutral. So these are uh, these are the examples to be followed in this region, which are uh, which are uh, giving us the pathways. And uh, final message uh, is uh, take concerted uh, climate action at all levels to keep uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Our people are ready, but uh, they want uh, a support from us uh, in terms of better data, knowledge, communication, and cooperation. So, EC mode uh, then moved uh, a step forward and uh, started uh, consulted, uh, consulting with uh, member countries. And uh, this consulta national consultation process was at the highest level. Secretaries, which are uh, board members of uh, EC mode, so they were taken on board and uh, their teams uh, participated uh, in this dialogue. And a uh, lot of uh, 
good news of cooperation, coordination in the region came in. So these are some uh, glimpses of uh, photos of those uh, meetings, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, Myanmar, China, Bangladesh, and uh, Afghanistan, all the eight member countries were uh, consulted and uh, very good outcomes uh, came in. Now I would like to share with you HKH uh, futures. And uh, those futures uh, are related to three di directions, environmental, social, and uh, economic uh, futures of HKH. Run downhill, muddling through advance towards prosperity. In fact, uh, prosperity is uh, the ultimate goal. Three factors uh, that uh, pose greatest threats to prosperity in the region are disasters, climate change, and poor governance. So there are uh, two pathways uh, towards uh, prosperity, large-scale investment with regional cooperation, and bottom-up uh, investment uh, with local and national cooperation. Both these pathways critically presuppose prerequisite cooperation and coordination and are not mutually exclusive. So ultimately we came, came up uh, to achieve a milestone for uh, science diplomacy in the region. And uh, ministers from uh, nodal ministries, they they joined uh, at uh, one platform and uh, they discussed uh, the issues of the region in the light of outcomes of uh, HKH assessment report of uh, EC mode. And uh, then they finally signed uh, a declaration, ministerial declaration uh, in HKH uh, region for call to action. So there is uh, now a serious move and uh, ministers agreed to hold biennial uh, HKH ministerial uh, mountain summits in uh, different uh, parts of uh, this region, promote uh, a united voice uh, for HKH at regional, global, and UN platforms. Recently, there was uh, a meeting uh, highly attended uh, uh, by uh, the member countries, and uh, they are uh, now joining to develop a joint uh, voice uh, HKS to Glasgow for uh, COP26. There are uh, strong messages coming up from this region. Hold uh, HKS science policy forums uh, on a regular basis uh, to, uh, to just uh, dilate uh, all these outcomes uh, coming from HKS assessment report and uh, the future directions of uh, uh, policy formulation. Constitute, there is uh, an idea to constitute a high level task force, which will be working on establishing a regional institutional mechanism based on uh, learnings from Ellipse, Carpathians and uh, Arctic, like Arctic Council, uh, if uh, HKS region can agree, that uh, council can serve uh, the ecosystem restoration of uh, HKS region effectively. This is uh, a brief uh, history from where we started. We started from 2015 and uh, we moved, uh, moved uh, to the HKS uh, assessment report uh, in 2019. 2020 was very important for us when ministerial declaration was signed and uh, six urgent calls to action were uh, taken very seriously. Now these efforts are continuing. So this is a beautiful picture which shows a lot of coherence uh, in the region and uh, I wish that uh, this should happen uh, in this way. Let's uh, work together 
to bring smiles uh, on these faces of population which, which is uh, living uh, in HKH region and they are uh, deprived of uh, prosperity. If prosperity will come, they will smile, their smiles will be long lasting. So with uh, thanks, I will share uh, the final message that HKH is uh, pulse of the planet. But uh, I have uh, narrated that is all about uh, HKH uh, region. And uh, this is uh, pulse of the planet. Let's together protect uh, the pulse of this planet. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Fatima or uh, Professor Das. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalam Rasul Saab, for a very interesting talk. Uh, am I audible to all of you? If there yeah. are. Yes, sir. Great, great. Uh, Professor Das, yes. uh, there are a few minutes left. Uh, may I share uh, some uh, meteorological? Uh, uh, meteorological data on uh, our forestation. I'm sorry. Uh, some... There are there are few minutes uh, left. Uh, if you allow me, I can uh, share. Uh, please, sure. Yeah. You would like to continue? May please continue. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, Pakistan started our forestation. Uh, in uh, 2013 in uh, Khyber Pakhtun province. Now those plants which were uh, planted uh, in 2014 or 15, they are uh, five, six years old. They have developed uh, enough uh, canopy. And uh, I wanted to, I wanted to calculate uh, the uh, meteorological parameters in that uh, uh, province. I collected uh, data from 13 uh, meteorological observatories uh, of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa region. And uh, I looked at uh, the time series uh, for uh, 10 years. There was uh, a temperature increasing trend uh, uh, during uh, the first uh, four or five years. Now, that trend after a short stabilization, that trend is now falling. And I came up with a conclusion that around 0.5 degrees Celsius temperature in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has dropped during the last five years. So this is the impact of our forestation on the climate uh, of any region. And also, if we look at the flash flooding events uh, I analyzed uh, over the last uh, 10, 10 years, there was, uh, there was increasing frequency and there was uh, increasing frequency of uh, uh, cloud dust and uh, flash floods along the mountainous region but uh, now that uh, frequency is reducing. I, uh, I can see that uh, that turmoil in uh, the precipitation pattern that is also being uh, addressed uh, uh, simultaneously uh, to normalize uh, the precipitation pattern. Although precipitation has never been uh, uh, normalized, it has uh, uh, always uh, ups and downs and uh, its uh, intensity varies, but that intensity is very closely related to the temperature, the thermodynamics of uh, the clim climate system. So when thermodynamics is uh, stabilizing, then that precipitation pattern is also stabilizing. These were a few results which I wanted to share Thank you very much for your patience uh, listening to me. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalam once again, for a very interesting talk. Uh, and this is a very, very important topic uh, to restore the mountain ecosystems, uh, which has been 
changing or degrading because of the uh, uh, climate change uh, due to the human uh, activities. Uh, uh, regarding the number of cloud bursts that you just mentioned uh, that occurred in Pakistan, you said that it is reducing uh, with time. Is that so? Uh, because uh, well, yeah, that's, it, yeah, yes. Yeah, that its uh, frequency is uh, coming down. Okay. Well, cloud otherwise, is, yes, yes, please. Yeah. Otherwise, in 13, 14, 15, in Chitral, uh, there were uh, uh, there were recurring uh, cloud uh, events uh, along uh, Shangla and uh, uh, the foothills of uh, Himalayas. So th there was uh, uh, th there was uh, th there was uh, uh, frequent uh, occurrence of uh, flash floods due to torrential rain in a very short span of time. Now that is uh, that is reducing. Right. Yeah. Well. Thank you. But this is. Yeah. This is. Yeah. Uh, this is a conclusion uh, based upon a short, uh, short span of data, just uh, seven, eight years. So we should not yeah. uh, assume yeah. that uh, this will continue. Right. Uh, this may change, but this is a visible trend. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, once again, now the session is open to questions from the participant and I request Dr. Swagata and Dr. Mohan Kumar to moderate the question and answer session. Dr. Swagata so, and Dr. Mohan. Yeah, yes. so the first question by TB Lakshmi Kumar, how to restore the ecosystem of Himalayas? What about other global mountain ecosystem in light of climate change? Uh, sir, uh, for the first question from TB Lakshmi Kumar from SRM University, how to restore the ecosystem of Himalayas? That I think you could cover. And what about other global mountain ecosystem in light of climate change? Yes, climate change. Uh, climate change uh, is the major uh, deterioration to uh, our ecosystem. But if we look at uh, look at the whole package uh, which uh, I was discussing. That gives us very strong message, first to address uh, climate change, and uh, when uh, we will be, we will be uh, collect, we will be making active effort to address uh, the global warming and climate change uh, in this region. Then ultimately there will be a redressal to to the ecosystem. Ecosystem will be. Restoring. I gave example of uh, our forestation uh, in uh, in Pakistan area. Uh, so there is uh, there is a large campaign, and I have witnessed uh, some uh, improving trends. Likewise, uh, likewise Himalaya calling. This is uh, this is a great initiative, which which is uh, supporting uh, the health of uh, ecosystem. In this way, we can gradually uh, improve uh, the uh, improve the uh, health of uh, ecosystems, and uh, ultimately, the restoration will come in. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. I have a question, uh, Mr. Gulam Rasul. Yes, please. Yeah, as you know better, uh, the trail of uh, in the Kush mountain in Afghanistan, especially in the northeast part of the country and central part of the Afghanistan. But uh, those people uh, who are not access to the energy and food, and uh, they are suffering uh, from everything, from poverty. And uh, what is the high uh, future plan for those people? Yeah, IC mode uh, teams, uh, my friend, uh, are already working in Afghanistan with uh, Afghanistan uh, national partners. And uh, we, uh, we have helped uh, colleagues, professionals, uh, to develop uh, the first uh, glacier inventory and lakes inventory. Recently, there was uh, outburst flood, glacial lake outburst flood 
and uh, my colleague uh, dr arun is with us uh, today he is uh, leading river basin initiative and uh, looking after the cryosphere uh, cryosphere of uh, hkh uh, region so that uh, outburst uh, was uh, immediately uh, analyzed and uh, results were shared with uh, our colleagues in uh, afghanistan and uh, we are always uh, looking at uh, the new new areas uh, where we can uh, help uh, the national partners so you have uh, mentioned this one and uh, my friend uh, dr arun will take note of that and uh, we can discuss uh, further on this issue and we can develop a proposal to work uh, together on this issue okay thank you Thank you, Nasim Muradi, for your excellent questions. Uh, Dr. Gorlam Rasul, sir, uh, there is uh, some couple of questions in the YouTube live channel also. We have received one question from uh, D. Rajan. What is the frequency of cloud burst over the region? Yeah, in, uh, in the region, this is uh, different. This is not uh, a uniform tendency uh, because uh, uh, all of uh, all parts of the region are not uh, receiving uh, monsoon, are not uh, uh, experiencing strong convection, but uh, uh, but the uh, but the regions, uh, the areas which are uh, uh, confronting uh, monsoon, those areas are uh, are getting uh, the essence of uh, cloud burst, and especially. In, uh, in the form of uh, strong convection. Uttarakhand uh, uh, last uh, event, uh, I don't recall uh, the exact name. Chamuli, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, there are four cloud cloud bursts. Rishi, Rishi Ganga flood in Chamuli, right, sir? Yeah, Very yeah. In February, Rishi Ganga flash flood in Chamuli. Oh. Okay, so th that was uh, that was the start of uh, spring season. At that time, uh, when we analyzed uh, Cape Cape indicator, it was giving uh, very strong, uh, very strong uh, potential energy to be converted into kinetic energy. So there, <clears throat> this is not uniform over the region. This is uh, uh, this is different, uh, different in uh, different parts, but. Uh, all those areas which are uh, which experiencing uh, monsoon, they are uh, they are more sus susceptible to uh, cloud burst events. Sir, thank you, sir. Sir, could you please uh, stop sharing your screen so people can see each other? Sharing uh, screen. Please stop screen. sharing the screen. Stop sharing yeah. and click simply. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, there is a, a one more question for, from the same person, D. Rajon. Uh, just uh, want to ask: In the year, is it increase? What is the time maximum rainfall on diagonal variation? Can you can you repeat it, please? Okay, sir. Sure, sure. Yeah. The question is: In the year, is it increase? And if it is increase, what is the time maximum rainfall on diagonal variation? Uh, I could not uh, get it. Uh, maybe, sir, he, uh, he uh, wished to ask uh, regarding the rainfall maximum or something like that. I mean, how is the diurnal variation of rainfall over the mountains? That is okay. the... very difficult. That's not important. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, if we look at uh, the usual pattern of uh, monsoon, so monsoon usually occurs uh, uh, late night or uh, early morning. This is, uh, this is the normal pattern, but uh, the, this differs uh, in different regions. So, a, gen yeah. a general statement for HKH region cannot be established. Okay, sir. Uh, I have seen some more questions. Uh, just I would, I would like to know from Dr. Darsar, sir, how much time is allowed for the question alone session? I have seen some more questions available in the YouTube live channel also. Choice is not clear. Uh, 
sir i would like to know how much time is allocated for uh, question answer session because i have seen more questions in the youtube live channel uh, can we go can we go for another two three questions yeah, yeah. So 10 minutes and it was 10 minutes that was ending to 1805 and we have reached this time 1806 okay Okay, so uh, Shagata, you can take care. Next two, three questions. I'm just asking one. Maybe there is two can more questions. Can you go for one question quickly? Okay. Yeah, this is from Propul Rao. Is the frequency of cloud bars more in the Western Himalayas? And why is the frequency of the cloud bars coming down? Yeah, cloud burst uh, events frequency I have talked about uh, Pakistan, which is. Uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Hindu Kush region. And uh, on the windward side, uh, there was uh, increasing frequency of the events uh, before uh, forestation. And now due to afforestation, I feel uh, the trend is uh, declining. The frequency is decreasing. So cloud burst events, uh, events are occurring, uh, nobody can predict them. And uh, nobody can uh, can uh, tell about uh, the climatology of uh, cloud burst events. Okay, okay sir. Thank, thank you. you. I have seen uh, Dr. Shagata also wish to ask one question. Dr. Shagata, please. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Padomita Rose, and the question is: Does forest type have impact on climate change at regional scale? You mean forest? Uh, the type of forest, and also she provided the example like broad leaf versus conifers. So different type yeah. of forest. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All type of vegetable vegetation uh, has uh, its contribution, but uh, from um, broad leaf uh, vegetation, there is a lot of uh, evapotranspiration, which is uh, which is pumping the moisture from uh, ground to the atmosphere. And uh, uh, there is uh, visible uh, climate cooling uh, in that uh, region. So that uh, that brings down uh, the vigorosity of uh, meteorology of that region also. Okay, sir. Thanks, for, thanks a lot for that. Uh, this question and answer. But last question, and which is really very uh, attractive. What are the other parameters influencing the frequency of cloud burst? event other than temperature and stability, specifically related to ecosystem change. So the gist of your talk, say, <laughs> so what are the... <laughs> yeah, but ecosystem, uh, ecosystem, our ecosystem suffered uh, uh, mainly from deforestation. And uh, uh, this afforestation uh, effort uh, is again uh, bringing us towards the equilibrium. If we look at the uh, cloud burst uh, events, cloud burst events, uh, if uh, monsoon dynamics is uh, increasing, is, if monsoon is getting stronger, this was my, this was my paper also on uh, uh, the Western region of uh, Chitral. When monsoon started reaching uh, to the higher heights of uh, the mountains, then uh, this was, I eye-opening for us to study what is happening. So if monsoon, is getting, monsoon uh, incursion is getting stronger, that, uh, that will add up uh, with the orographic lift also. Convection is, uh, is an other fuel which is uh, given to the system. So orography plays very important role uh, in cloud burst uh, events if strong incursions of uh, monsoon are there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. And now it's over to Professor Sohasar. Thank you, sir. So if there are no other questions, then we thank once again the distinguished speaker, Dr. Gulam Rasool, for his very interesting and inspiring talk. Thank you very much, sir. Um, our next program is the panel discussion. Today, uh, we have got very distinguished panelists from uh, six different countries which are joining the Hindutus Himalayan region, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, and Pakistan. Uh, I'll 
try to introduce briefly one by one the panel members from each of those countries uh, in alphabetical order of the countries so starting with uh, afghanistan uh, we have the panel member mr nasim muradi uh, he is the director of forecasts of afghanistan meteorological department he served as an it expert in the directory of briefing and head of the forecast division in afghanistan civil aviation authority for more than 20 years he graduated from department of hydrometeorology geoscience faculty of kabul university his main job is to provide leadership and management of the staff and provide professional technical advice to meet the goals and programs of the office issuing weather warning for public use such as flood warning dust warning temperature warning and publishing it at afghanistan meteorological department site uh thank you very much mr nasim radi for being present in the for the panel discussion our next distinguished panel member is from bangladesh dr atik rahman sir dr atik rahman is the executive director of bangladesh center for advanced studies vikas he is a prominent environmentalist scientist development expert and a visionary thinker in south asia he is well known worldwide for his pioneering role and contribution to environment and nature conservation climate change poverty alleviation and sustainable development he was honored with the highest un environmental award the champion of the earth for the year 2008 in recognition of his outstanding and inspirational leadership and contribution globally regionally nationally and locally to the protection and sustainable management of the earth's environment and natural resources another outstanding achievement in the same year given by the government of bangladesh was the national environmental award pori base padak for the category of innovative environmental research and technology development he is a long standing leader lead author and convening lead author of ipcc as a lead author of the ipcc fourth assessment he was a co recipient of the nobel peace prize of 2007 jointly awarded to ipcc and al gore well dr atik rahman has a long list of achievements uh, i'll try to read as much as you know possible uh, uh, he holds a phd in industrial and applied chemistry from brunel university of west london the executive director of the bangladesh center for advanced studies that i have already said he has transformed this ngo into a leading think tank of environment resource management and sustainable development issues with his national and international experience in environment and resource management dr rahman's expertise remains vital throughout the asia pacific region and beyond as he helps to raise awareness of the hazards of the global warming dr rahman has been conferred with the unep uh, champions of the earth 2008 award he has been consultant to the world bank asian development bank undp un desa unep ifr ad iscap UN City AD Asian Development Bank UNICEF UNESCO many national governments several national and international NGOs since 1996 Dr Rahman has been a visiting professor to the International Diplomacy and Sustainable Development at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy Tufts University in Boston in USA he has published more than 100 papers in international journals and books on environmental and solid state chemistry environmental planning and impact assessment and renewable energy technology and policy natural disasters and global planning issues science for policy people interface since 1975 as a scientist research and policy planner thank you very much sir for gracing this occasion and being part of the panel discussion dr atik raman sir our next distinguished panel member is from bhutan Dr Singe Dorji Dr Singe Dorji is the chief weather and climate services division national center for 
hydrology and meteorology royal government of bhutan dr dorji is a civil engineer by degree he has got bachelor of engineering master of engineering and phd he has experience in climate change studies and research short term to medium and seasonal forecasting aviation meteorology data management he has experience in road construction project management and environmental management he is a member of the wmo commission for weather climate water science scientific advisory committee of bimstech bcwc team leader of jtt on flood management between india and bhutan so welcome dr singh dorji from bhutan uh the next uh, panel member is supposed to be professor ap dimri is professor dimri present has he joined uh, professor dimri are you there i think uh, professor dimri is not there he has some some difficulty probably so he has not been able to join uh our next uh, panel member from india is another distinguished person uh dr sarla khaling she is the regional director asoka trust for research in ecology and in the environment sikkim she is a native of darjeeling dr khaling is a trained and as an ecologist as well as an interdisciplinary research in the environment sector she has worked for the past 15 plus years in on enhancing biodiversity conservation ecosystem services and human well being and sustainable livelihoods most of these have was focused on mountain areas of nepal northeast india and bhutan dr sarla got her phd in geology ecology from north bengal university and her post doctoral work includes people and institutions in north bengal her interests are on socio ecological landscapes ecosystems and ecosystem services especially in the mountains and hills of the northeast india and north bengal currently she is also working with collaborators on sustainable agriculture sustainable food systems one health and endangered species for the past 7 plus years she has also been working on building capacity of students researchers community leaders and local civil society organizations in northeast india then our next uh, distinguished panel member is dr arun bakshrest from nepal he is working as a regional program manager of river basins and cross fair in isi mode at kathmandu dr arun has phd in earth sciences from the university of new hampshire usa his, his doctoral dissertation was on the physical and chemical climate of the himalayas he also earned a masters degree in hydraulic engineering from belarusian polytechnic institute in in former soviet union since he joined isi mode in 2006 he has worked in various capacities including action area team leader for strengthening of stream downstream linkages regional program manager for river basins program and acting program manager for the cross fair and atmospheric program before joining isi mode he served in the department of hydrology and meteorology government of nepal where he was responsible for the operation of high altitude hydro meteorological station so welcome dr arun bhakt shrestha from nepal our next distinguished panel member is from pakistan dr ali taqir sheikh dr ali taqir sheikh is an independent water and climate change expert he is a member of on the national climate change council chaired by the prime minister of pakistan he is also a member of external advisory group on south asia region climate change action plan set up by the world bank that is in, engaged in strategic level deliberations on identifying shared regional climate issues requiring collaborative endeavors he is a member of the policy board auditor general of pakistan that provides recommendations on the strategic issues pertaining to environment and climate change dr ali previously has served on several national commissions and international committees and that includes the advisory group on learning and evaluation and the transformational change learning parts partnerships both set up by the climate investment fund 
on behalf of the world bank and other multilateral development banks he has served on the climate change commission set up by the supreme court of pakistan and the national task force on tourism chaired by the prime minister of pakistan he has served on as founding director of lead pakistan from 1995 to 2019 and asia director cdkn from 2009 to 2017 spearing spearheading climate compatible development in several countries in asia so thank you dr taukir ali saab for being present here we all welcome you very much and uh, the last but not the least uh, our moderator is professor rajesh kumar my former colleague at central university of rajasthan he is the dean of the school of earth sciences and head of the department of the environmental sciences at central university of pakistan in india professor rajesh kumar is the d uh, well uh, he completed his msc tech and phd from banaras hindu university before joining the central university of pakistan he was associated with national physical laboratory in new delhi jawala nehru university birla institute of technology jaipur and sarda university in delhi ncr with extensive research and teaching experience of more than 21 years professor rajesh kumar has published 104 papers in various journals and book chapters including two papers in nature scientific reports professor kumar has supervised 11 phd scholars he has received eight research grants more than 30 million indian rupees from international and national organizations He has been listed among the two percent of the world's scientists in the Stanford University list 2020. He is working on research areas like glaciology, climate change, impact assessment on slow and snow and glaciers, water quality and quality assessment in the snow and glacier-fed river systems of Himalayas, air pollution and application of remote sensing and GIS on cryosphere research. Professor Kumar spends a challenging time tracking glaciers. locations up to an altitude of more than 18000 feet with temperature lower than minus 15 degrees centigrade and stays in a tent on the glaciers for a couple of weeks in those regions for the collection of valuable data he worked on the several glaciers like gangotri chota singri kapni naradu saunu garan suru and batel etc professor Kumar is a member of several academic societies and the editorial board of national and international journal. Uh, he has been invited uh, for interview in the media like BBC News, CNN, IBN, Aaj Tak, Hindustan Times, the Hindu, BBC Radio, and All India Radio, Jaipur. Uh, they have all interviewed him on climate-related issues. So, welcome, Professor Rajesh Kumar, and thank you very much for being present here. and now the floor is to you to moderate this uh, panel discussion professor rajesh kumar please thank you so much sir uh, and for giving this opportunity to be a part of this international program where we have a very learned panelist available here so we all together shall be learning with this their expertise of the different domain and long experience of working in the hks region so let me have a brief introduction of the problem then i'll go with this one by one views of the panelists and we have total number of six panelists available over here uh, we were expecting one more but unfortunately two more one from myanmar and one from india uh, professor ingri uh, may not be able to join with some of the reason so we are six over here so we will have five minutes in first round for everyone and then followed by the wrap up round for one minute to everyone so before going there i have my own views that i am going to share over here and with this we will start here so what we learned is that nature is a great experimenter and this nature is basically doing several experiments in the course of time and if you look back it is being constantly experimenting since millions of years it has discarded the dinosaurs which has discarded probably the saber tooth tigers and many other species why this has happened a few of these species have survived for 200 years 200000 years and few of them have survived for 10 to 20 million years 
this is just a kind of information including many others but the question is how sure are we about the success of our species the human are we going to survive forever that we are thinking about it means that if we need to survive for ever we have to be beneficial for the nature in whole not in part by part so we are taking this issues in global perspective if we are not going to be beneficial for the whole the nature would discard us also so there is a threat for us also thus we need to have a conservation with the planet or what would be the message from the planet earth you are going to ask probably planet earth will say that i am happy with your behavior all human we are probably more demanding we are probably more damaging than the smallpox virus that doesn't exist now we are more demanding and damaging we are causing greater calamities we are being cruel to this planet of ours if we look any other species every other species kills somebody else or kills another species only for its own survival only when it is threatened or when it is very hungry but we as a human species we have not evolved in that manner we have evolved in different way we kill another species not for our own survival but to prove our superiority over the others to prove our dominance over the entire planet or sometimes even for our pleasure we are not being beneficial to the nature as whole which has been proved again and again in due course of the time and we can recall this and coming to the today's topic that's about the mountain ecosystem restoration so this mountains are very fragile ecosystem including the youngest mountain system of himalayas the hkh region we are talking about for today's discussion so under the changing climate and global warming the anthropogenic interventions of ours that soar an increase in frequency of disasters in hkh region in terms of the cloud burst glacial lake outburst flood landslides avalanches etc the threat due to over exploitation of the water resources for hydro power projects is another concern towards the ecosystem deterioration the world in one day do have the theme of ecosystem restoration so our discussion is well aligned and hope will come with the fruitful outcomes and recommendations for the scientific communities in this view so as we discussed that we are four having four panelists so we are going to have five minutes each and i will go in the order of the, the panelists being introduced so first i will look forward the views from dr nasheem muradi from afghanistan he is a person of geoscience and hydrometeorology and is a director for cast sir what is the major concern as hydrometeorology in ecosystem restoration because it is well proved that ecosystem needs restoration means it, it has been damaged a lot so sir you have 5 minutes to give your views nasheem sir okay okay thank you sir uh, ecosystem uh, as an obeter uh, uh, if you if you can uh, sir if you can switch on your video it would be great to us yeah if possible yeah please <clears throat> Yeah, as you know, better uh, ecosystem is uh, effective for uh, all the world, especially for Afghanistan. As you know, better uh, the temperature uh, increase one uh, point five degree. That is uh, effective Afghanistan also in uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, linear condition also in Afghanistan. We have drought some part of the country. Also. in uh, especially in the west um, uh, north part of afghanistan uh, west and south west part of the country and central part of the country that is um, and uh, in the oi uh, mountain uh, in the end kush mountain before that i was mentioned it uh, a lot of people they are living 
and uh, they are not access to uh, the, the internet uh, we publish uh, our uh, uh, warning uh, they are not access to the internet also they are not uh, secure they are uh, not uh, access to their food uh, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, they know uh, they have uh, less uh, knowledge about the, the especially the weather forecast and uh, about the climate uh, change it is uh, difficult, uh, difficult uh, for those people. Uh, as you know, the Afghanistan, uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, has uh, more uh, as natural other such as uh, flooding, earthquakes, snow, and uh, avalanche cases, uh, landslides, and uh, drought happening every year. And uh, the people uh, they are uh, lose. Uh, 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 everything, uh, life, uh, it is um, uh, more important for Afghan people uh, to know. And also, uh, as an better, the security problem, uh, we have security problem in our country. For uh, one month, uh, the enemies of uh, Afghanistan, they destroyed about uh, uh, 30 pillars of uh, energy. The people, uh, it is uh, difficult for to people to announce the people we have uh, uh, flash flood. We are working on the flash flood. We, we have uh, FFGS uh, system in our department. And um, it is, uh, after that we publish, but the people uh, don't know, the people don't know how to uh, access uh, to the, 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 they are not access to the energy. Uh, to to for the rescue of the, the the people. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have your views that uh, what are the means that you are taking care for ecosystem restoration or your country's perspective in this direction for ecosystem restoration? Are any steps being taken care and how much is being achieved as of now? Yeah, yeah, for, for the ecosystem. For the ecosystem, uh, some other organizations, they are working. Uh, they are working on the ecosystem, uh, especially in the... Uh, Which type of ecosystem has been taken care? Yeah. Which type of ecosystem has been taken care? And what is the, the restoration uh, pace on that? You unmute yourself. By chance, uh, yeah, unmute yourself. Yeah, now please speak. Yeah, well, I mentioned it. Uh, 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 some uh, organization they are working on the ecosystem, uh, they are announced to the people, uh, especially the uh, Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, they are working on the ecosystem. We are working on the, but uh, we are working on the uh, forecast division. We announce uh, to the people we are providing weather information. We uh, disseminate uh, information to, to the other, other uh, stakeholders. So major way of doing it is your awareness program to the communities is the major role being played. Isn't it? Or any technological interventions for this restoration of ecosystem? Yes, yes, sir. Anyway. Okay, thank you very much, Nashim Saab. Yeah, so uh, now we shall be moving to the next round. And the next panelist is in the order is Professor Dr. Atik Rahman from Bangladesh. He has a sound background of environment and he has achieved environment award for innovative environment research and technology development. So probably there would be some technological aspects coming up from his views. He is the lead author of the IPCC. So his experience speaks a lot that he is giving input to the entire communities in academia in the IPCC chapter writing. And he is PhD of industrial and applied chemistry from UK. So this chemistry term is very much required to understand then you are thinking for deterioration of ecosystem and restoration will take something converse of it. And apart from this, he has started one NGO. I may understand that this could be a kind of motivation to do something. Uh, 
for the ecosystem restoration, for the betterment of the environment, to manage, and also looking to that for sustainable development of the uh, uh, region. So with this, sir, looking into your, your vast expertise as environmental research and development and uh, starting an NGO for environmental management and sustainable development, please highlight the, the August gathering with your concern in theoretical and practical aspects of restoring ecosystem and how much has been achieved in your region of interest by even your NGO also. So it would be great to learn and to be implemented in future to the other regions inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear okay. you, sir. Very uh, well. Right. Uh, um, the five minutes allocated to me, I'll try and focus. First of all, uh, the so-called, what you called NGO, we are not an NGO. This is a internationally highly recognized think tank, which has been declared as the highest center of excellence in the developing country as a whole. So it's oh. just not Bangladesh. And we have published 27 outstanding books. 12 of them are textbooks in Harvard, MIT, and all, all those uh, top places. And at the same time, we are looking at two different systems. And I will just mix, explain how that works and I will address your question. The first system can be called as a governance type of system, which is science, policy, people. There is a triangulation of science, what we heard from the excellent presentation of our keynote paper. He has brought in most huge amount of science in the uh, mountain range, particularly the HKH system. And uh, policy, which was a bit, needs to be discussed because we are part of mostly South Asia and South Asia wastes more time arguing with each other than developing, helping each other. So there is a serious governance lacking, lacking there and that the whole policy world needs to be improved. And I propose that rather than talking in terms of South Asia like SARC, which is a non-starter, let's talk about Hindu Kush Himalayan systems. Of course, that doesn't take adequately uh, Sri Lanka and Maldives, but we can. There are ways of water linkages through which we can get them in. So, but Bangladesh is part of that system. And the people, mm -hmm. the huge population in this area is one of the poorest people in the world with one of the highest amount of natural resources endowed in the mountains, in the plains, in the water system, and we have not maximally used it. And that's the limitation of our science because we have been busy trying to do science, which is not necessarily for the people. Our scientists get their PhDs abroad and then they come and do their little bit of another 20 papers. So, so that's not what I want. So what we do is addressing the social questions. The other dimension is what I would call a systemic dimension, which is the ecosystem and environment, our natural resource system. You mentioned that we have not been very good with our natural resource taking care. Partly true, partly not true. We are part of natural system. Human being is a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the natural system and not a dominating system. We are the cruelest, cruelest, and most unthinking part of the natural resource system. There is a serious need for total genetic transformation of this species called Homo sapiens. That's another story. Then this ecosystem services, we have the social system, where South Asian social system is totally, thoroughly uh, entrenched with many hierarchies and lack of flow and the flourishing of the best potential for the society. So we have not done very well with our social system. We have created more division than enhancing for our own good. Uh, and then we have the economic system. In the economic system, we were mostly agrarian in nature, though industrialization has started, but in agriculture, we have not been able to, there is still shortage of food, there is still shortage of, um, uh, even we are destroying our biological species uh, and the system that it has. 
the great resource we have is water. And that is what links highland, lowland interaction, which is the mountain's main criteria. The whole Himalayan Hindu Kush ecosystem has, let's say for simplicity, three tiers, the highland, highest amount of cryosphere, lowest number of people, the mid range, medium range of people, and medium mixing of cold to hydro, hydro system with rivers and flowing system. And then we have the plains, which comes down to India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the whole big areas uh, all over, uh, including plains of Nepal and Bhutan. So that is, those three systems need to be integrated and we have to take those into account. So in the governance system, we have to look at governing the system. And one of the studies you mentioned that the uh, ECMOD did on the assessment of the Himalayan uh, Hindu Kush resources in 2015, I happened to be the one of the key people to start that process and make it a bit more IPCC type orientation so that all the uh, top scientists of South Asia can take part in it uh, from the Hindu Kush region. And we, have, and we have succeeded. I think there's a good volume there on which to start. And the, we call that the state of knowledge as it were, but we have to. So I'll finish there just by saying that these two systems offers us the opportunity to move forward. Science, we know a bit better. Ordinary people do not use the science optimally because we scientists have failed to communicate the best science and transform into policy and take it. So we should be able to feed our people, give them all the welfare they need, and sustainable development goal is a, I mean, I have been one of the people who had been systemic in developing this word sustainable development and pushing it into the global agenda. So that is moving on. And I think that gives us a way to move forward. Let me stop there for this. I uh, hope there will be other interaction to come in. Thank you so much, sir, for your views. And you very rightly said one very pinpointed words where the government governance lacking. Of course, that is required. From there, only it can happen. And you have really thought about the sustainable development where you have talked about the society environment and the economy all together. Then only we can, this achievement would be a great success. Now we have to move towards the next panelist, Dr. Singhai Dorji from Bhutan. Dr. Dorji is a civil engineer with PhD. He is a climate change expert and he has experience of road construction. So apart from this general type of the ecosystem, restoration that we are talking, I have another very specific queries that I, I would like you to address over here is that during your road development, what are the concerns that you are finding because of the, one of the disaster coming as a landslide over there? And how much this puts your impact to economy as well as the deterioration of the ecosystem while making roads on the mountain system. Thank you, sir. Your time starts now, please. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm surprised that I'm being asked on the road construction, uh, which is a profession that uh, uh, I did uh, many years ago. But uh, nonetheless, uh, first, uh, let me try to landslide in this impact. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. First, let me try to answer Sorry. your uh, answer uh, directly. Uh, as all the esteemed members are already aware, uh, road construction uh, is a, a major uh, threat uh, to the ecosystem uh, as well as to the environment. And uh, you know, when I was working for the Department of Roads, actually we adopted uh, a system of uh, construction technology called the Environment Friendly Road Construction. Uh, that uh, technology actually cost about 30% uh, more than the actual uh, normal way of uh, constructing roads. And um, it is not uh, short of challenges. There are a lot of challenges, especially in a mountain ecosystem, when we are trying to do a road, then uh, to, to uh, cause, uh, to create, uh, to, to try to minimize the damages, it is very uh, very challenging but at the same time i think uh, uh, we have had um, actually got a lot of good experiences from countries in the region like nepal 
uh, who has uh, successfully uh, you know implemented a lot of uh, this environment friendly road construction so definitely directly answering to your question uh, that is one way in which uh, we can uh, help the ecosystem and uh, just i i'm just uh, uh, wanting to add a few more things uh, if uh, if i'm allowed um, actually bhutan uh, from our, uh, as an NMHS, uh, from our point of view, uh, actually, we do not know much on the policy side as to what is happening uh, at the government level. But from, uh, from uh, a hydrometeorological uh, office's point of view, we believe that uh, uh, melting of uh, glaciers and uh, the associated risks of glough uh, flood and uh, drying of streams, as well as extreme weather events are three of the major uh, issues uh, that are impacting uh, our country as well as many other countries uh, in the world. Um, Glove incidences also now is on the rise and uh, uh, disasters like flood and especially uh, disasters that are uh, induced by wind are uh, on the rise in Bhutan and that is one of the challenge because uh, we, our forecasters actually do not have a very clear uh, idea on uh, how we can uh, forecast uh, wind and uh, associated uh, uh, damages that are caused by the wind. But I'm, I'm also uh, happy to also report uh, to, to this panel that uh, as mentioned by Dr. Gulam uh, in his presentation, uh, Bhutan actually has done uh, quite a a uh, lot of things in order to try to protect the ecosystem. Uh, I think Dr. Gulam already mentioned that uh, we have uh, a declaration to stay uh, carbon neutral at all times made uh, way back in 2009 in the Conference of uh, Party 15, and as well as reiterated in um, the, uh, the succeeding uh, uh, Conference of Parties. As well as uh, one uh, uh, key thing that I would like to share is uh, uh, to have 60% uh, forest cover uh, in the country uh, maintained at all time uh, is a constitutional uh, requirement. So therefore, there are lots of plans and policies and programs in place in order to achieve uh, 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 those, uh, those uh, targets. Uh, for instance, even for um, uh, ecosystem from the point of uh, endangered species also very very strong laws and policies are in place. So I think uh, uh, Bhutan is uh, actually trying its best to, to protect the ecosystem. And uh, I'm uh, very much thankful to uh, the speaker, Dr. Gulam, uh, who has uh, clearly shared the risks uh, that climate change uh, poses on uh, the region as a whole. And uh, Bhutan, as you know, is an agriculture dependent country and uh, hydropower is one of the main economic activities of the country. So therefore, you know, impacts of climate change on melting of glaciers and erratic rainfall, all those kind of, all those um, impacts of climate change are going to have a huge impact uh, on Bhutan. And yes, sir, you are just on time, just five minutes over and you have finished yourself. Very nicely said, you are the, the uh, person from the country that has the highest uh, uh, value of ecosystem caring and you are one of the happiest uh, people of the world and your nature love is really admired by everyone on the globe. And the forest cover that you really maintain for 60% and 60% all the time is very nicely said and you have quoted Gulam Rasul several times and he has given in the solution mode that the ecosystem Deterioration is originated because of the deforestation and you have to maintain the forest and that you are doing. So we have to take away something good message from your side that first of all, we have to think for afforestation, increasing the forest cover to save the environment. Now moving to the next panelist. We have Dr. Sarala Kaling from India. And she is from the mountain, very well said that from the Darjeeling, Sikkim. So she must be having the all experience in the real mountain world. And we will be expecting many more things of the real true story coming up. 
how the ecosystem and can be restored in some of the case studies she is a ecologist and she is working for the biodiversity conservation the well team that we are uh, having over here ecosystem services and human well being and sustainable livelihood would have been her, her topic of work and research so madam the question goes to you apart from the all the ecosystem restoration technologies that you are using what are the challenges of sustainable biodiversity and human well being that you are addressing over there and let us discuss with uh, some of the case studies uh, that has been done by you and the way forward to this uh, esteemed gathering please ma'am time starts now yes Right. Thank you, Professor, for the opportunity, and also to Professor Tiagi for the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, August panel and to be part of this uh, webinar. First of all, I just would want to give, uh, since there are uh, people from other countries also and from other uh, domain knowledge, that uh, we are in very exciting times because this is the decade for ecosystem restoration, which started on fifth. june uh, because uh, the born uh, agreement which actually this is the place where countries went and committed how much of hectares of ecosystems that they are going to restore so as an international uh, commitment india also has a huge commitment so it's almost it's 26 million hectares and top of that is added by again about uh 20 to uh, 30 million hectares of forest cover by 2030 so that is again the ndc the commitment that india has so india has a huge commitment is what i want to say and i think uh, we uh, in the mountains right across india i speak for in, for the indian part in the indian himalayan region we have a very very big responsibility and op opportunity also in to uh, restore the mountain ecosystems that we have and again when we talk of the mountain ecosystems what we have to remember it's that not just the forests that we have but the diversity of ecosystems that mountain has we have a huge agro ecosystems and a lot of agroforestry systems especially in the mountains of course we have our forests but we also have wetlands and we have our springs which are the most important resources and ecosystems which we need to restore and we have been affected by the various kind of threats that people have been talking about our river ecosystem restoration how are we going to get there they are all dammed there all there's all hydropower so how are we going to start tackling our river ecosystems our alpine grasslands or the rangelands where a large part of our pastoral transhumans population is dependent the peatlands which are supposed to be sequestering carbon and then the most important is our urban ecosystems you know sometimes we forget the urban ecosystems but that is where the demand of urban population sometimes drives some of the threats that we are talking about so i think uh, we have to think about it from these terms that we are not dealing with one but several ecosystems so therefore i think for ecosystem restoration to happen uh, first we need to have a common understanding because it cannot be done by one department of the government or one organization or one scientific organization or just communities so even to have a common understanding of what is ecosystem restoration is also going to be very important and of course the coordination and then comes the challenges of how do you identify which are the landscapes that you have to restore in the indian himalayan region in terms of ecosystem restoration how do you define these landscapes how do you identify these landscapes and if you which baseline are you going to say so that in 2030 you say we were this in this year are you going to take 2011 when the bond declaration was done or in 2015 when we went and said that we will do 21 million hectares which later on Uh, the honorable prime minister said 26 million probably last year or year before last year so how are we going to uh, identify these landscapes because we have official figures we are which are very very different so one official figure says about 96.4 million hectares is under desertification whereas the forest research uh, survey of india says 60 million hectares need restoration so again 
you know, in many areas, grasslands and places like that, riverine ecosystems are again uh, categorized as they're very important ecosystems, but they're categorized as waste, wasteland. So there is a, a challenge over there. The other thing is most of these are remotely sense based uh, information and the challenge is to get the ground truthing done and do it at the ground level. Then what are the indicators are we going to set up for ourselves when we reach 2030 to say that we have reached our target or we haven't reached our target or we are progressing. So this is at a national level, but at the mountain level, how do we set up mountain specific implementation strategies in place? How do we, mountains are again completely different and we have, uh, and as part of the, I'm also part of the integrated mountain initiative, which is a, body of civil society, government, legislatures. So we are an organization which we are advocating that, you know, mountains must have mountain specific policies in India. So because we have a very small portion, sometimes we get these blanket policies. So even in terms of ecosystem restoration, it is, it's very important that we have mountain specific you know, implementation. The other challenge is intersectoral coordination. Most of us have worked in the with the government or some have some experience. Many times we work in different different sectors, you know, and the sectors do not talk to each other. So, therefore, we have these contrasting policies, contradicting policies, uh, linking to the same goal. But at the same time, I think we have uh, we have opportunities because we have existing systems, we uh, which we can you know, and we have lots of uh, uh, things that are already going on to be dependent on. I would think you know. We really need to do a biome specific design for this restoration. We can't just have one blanket kind of a thing for all. Even in the mountains, we have several different ecosystems. So we have to do our restoration according to these. And the restoration has, is just not putting up some standing trees. They have to really be ecologically and hydrologically informed kind of restoration so that the restoration is functional and how do you you know you set up these indicators what do you a functional ecosystem that there are species surviving there that the functions of the ecosystem are happening that the provisioning of ecosystem services whether they be uh, provisioning services whether they be regulating supporting whatever cultural biodiversity is there. so then only your ecosystem is, you can say it's restored but at the same time, restoration also has to uh, have a livelihood opportunities providing, I would think, you know, how do we link this to a Manrega, the right to employment scheme, which is the biggest scheme that we have in the country or even in the mountains, how do we, link, how do we reform the way we do agriculture in the mountains to make it more sustainable and regenerative? So that you know we we are restoring our agro ecosystem, especially our soil. This is where this is that is where the carbon is, and that is uh, where we can you know create a system of restoration or more sustainable uh, production system. And there are several models, like you were saying. Um, you know, your time is up, so you have already taken two minutes more than your time allotted. Okay. So okay. we will have okay. your views again in the wrap-up round. Okay. Very nicely All well right. said that India's commitment for ecosystem restoration, there are many ways, and India has given commitment on the carbon footprints and the renewable energies and segments and that all are going to help in ecosystem restoration. You have come up with the very right database uh, of talking about the ecosystem and identifying it and the ecological and hydrological way and then managing it. And very well said that to have some indicator by 2030 that you assess yourself. What were the indicator on which you have worked upon and how much you have achieved? Very well said, ma'am. And it could be a take away message from this forum that there should be indicator to be defined on which we are going to assess ourselves in the end of the decade. Yes. Very nicely well said. And now it's turn is from uh, to take another panelist. And he is none other than Dr. Arun Vakta Sresha. Namaskar Pranam. And I know Arun sir since very long time he is very renowned environmentalist in my views. And his doctorate from USA in Earth Sciences and hydraulic engineer. So he has combination of engineering, science altogether, and a very good academic leader of the cryosphere and atmospheric program. And after coming to the EC board, he has done marvelous job. And in also the DHM, he was very instrumental 
in doing the hydrometeorological work over there. So, sir, being a person of Himalayas, I, I always when look you. I, I think that you are one of the representatives of the Himalayas and FCA region. So, my expectation is that your physical and scientific observation of changing ecosystem in the HKH region, since you have long experience in working on this, scientifically you have given so many good papers that I have read and worked across. And being at IC mode, you are very closely monitoring the impact of changing ecosystem to the mountain communities. So, uh, mountain people kind of things when comes, it IC mode comes in our mind, thinking for the mountain community. So, sir, with your vast experience, we would like to know that how do you manage the challenges of deterioration, deteriorations of the ecosystem and its impact to the mountain communities at large and to several landslides and the gloves and many other even cloud bursts, many kind of the disasters you, your region is facing and your easy mode along with you together you are working. Thank you, sir. Your time starts now. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Rajesh sir. Um, the most uh, interesting thing about today's panel is the panelists were not given the question. So, you know, we have to speak uh, impromptu. We should not prepare and we're not anticipating. Uh, let me try my best. Now, I was introduced as a representative from Nepal, which I'm proud to be. So while I work regionally, um, I would probably focus uh, this uh, intervention um, in Nepal, right? And, and my colleague has already given a broader edge case level overview. Now, your question, I'll come to that. I definitely, I'll come to that. Before that, I would probably give a context uh, based on Nepal. I think Nepal, I would say, is uh, also a mini Please speak a little louder, please, yeah. Uh, I need to speak louder? Yeah, just it was not audible to you. Uh, yeah, okay. Let, let me continue. Yeah, that was not my time, right? Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, it's it's like a mini Hindu Kush Himalayan region with, you know, elevation ranging from as low as 65 to 8,850 meters above sea. And then having crests like uh, Lumli, which has uh, more than 5,000, Millimeter rainfall per annum um, to place like Mustang, which has around 200 millimeter per annum, like in Ladakh, for example, right? So it, it is, but then, uh, you know, this country is also endowed by like uh, 3,800 uh, glaciers covering an area of uh, over 4,000 square kilometers and supplying water to uh, three major river basins, uh, Koshi, Gandak, Narayani, and Karnali. And it is said, I have not counted, but they say that there are 6,000 rivers and rivulets flowing through Nepal. And altogether around 225 cubic kilometer of water flows out of this small country, relatively small country, occupying just an area of 147,000 square kilometers, you can imagine. And, uh, and, and that number, 225 kilometer cube, is adequate to irrigate you know, supply 15% of global annual irrigation water demand. So that gives you a perspective, right? So there are a lot of, uh, you know, even from this small country in central Hindu Kush Himalaya region, there are a lot of ecosystem services, like what I said, water, but then energy. Uh, Nepal has a potential of around 50,000 megawatt uh, electricity generation, of which only 1,100 has been utilized. And this can actually provide service to a larger part of the region, not only Nepal. But then there are also disservices. We are only talking about services. There are also disservices like floods, landslides, debris flow, flash flood, etc. Right? And both services and disservices from ecosystem actually can transcend national boundaries. They can be transboundary. Uh, now, what is happening, Rajasji, is due to many different changes. The climatic, climatic change is one, but there are many other drivers, in bar, other environmental drivers, socioeconomic changes, yes. behavioral changes. I think the ecosystem services are, are set. The services are uh, dwindling, and these services are increasing. Uh, for example, glaciers and shrinking uh, glaciers are shrinking, causing disruption in hydrological regimes and extremes. 
plus landslide debris flows are you know more frequent and there was recently a tweet by a renowned you know uh, you know geologist that the landslides in nepal is occurring more and more earlier every year so that kind of change is happening and there are indications that new types of hazards are happening different types of ha hazards are happening simultaneously creating complex uh, scenarios and cascading hazards are um, you know occurring the chamoli case was earlier is a very excellent example of cascading impacts we recently had this uh, you know melamji flood also you know uh, having this cascading impact so these are some of the things which we are already you know facing and as you have rightly said the first you know group of people exposed to those challenges are communities i think and and communities are are really vulnerable they are getting more and more exposed um, to those you know environment not because of increasing frequency and magnitude of of those hazards but also the communities are more and more exposed their position with respect to hazard are changing they are moving more and more into more hazardous zone that something we need to um, you know realize now what to do i think um what to do these are the challenges but can we do something definitely we cannot go the way we have been going so far we radically need to change the way we have been thinking about development does it mean we have to stop development do, 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 does it mean that we have to stop our development aspiration definitely not but i think repeating myself again we really need to change our development pattern and i think the term right now very popular these days is this term called green resilient and inclusive development pathways in short grid you know and many of us have heard about it now to wind up my you know 5 minute uh, uh, probably i would just remind ourselves what green resilient and inclusive means right and that's very important um, concerning your question what it means to community now green definitely is not just forestry i think that is something which we should not think about it's not only about leaves and twigs you know it's more more than that green growth means anything which is you know fostering economic growth first of all and development while ensuring that natural assets continue to provide the resources and environmental services on which well being relies and here community aspect is very important right sometimes we develop but take away the resources from community who had a prior you know use and right to it now what is resilient we all know that but let's remind ourselves through inclusive systems building and capacity development individuals and communities have what they need to better prepare manage and recover from crisis again when we talk about resilience communities are in the forefront and then inclusive of course the word inclusive you cannot think about it without community right development that includes marginalized people sectors and countries in social political and economic processes for increased human well-being social and environmental sustainability and empowerment so these are the three crucial element, elements of uh, grid green resilient and inclusive and i think these are nothing new but what has happened due to the challenges the crisis that climate and other you know drivers have put we are forced to think about grid and we are forced to take it very seriously otherwise i think we are not going to you know coexist with the environment thank you so much Uh, thank you so much sir for your really coming out very nicely with the many things addressed over here and to name is one is the socio economic challenges that you really address with this and hydrological concerns over there and the new case of the hazard that you really give an example of the chamoli on which you have already published one paper on that uh, have gone through that really it was a new challenge to understand how this flash flood has happened it was really if there would not be having some remote sensing aspect of understanding some plans would have taken place and this change in so it would have been very difficult to understand what has happened exactly when there's location and that, that's the devastation so new challenges of this you have addressed 
and green resilient and inclusive development very well said and this could be a take away message from this panelist so i hope uh, fatima ma'am would have been noting it out for making a recommendation thank you so much sir and now it's time to thank switch you. on to our the next and last panelist dr ali sheikh sir namaskar sir ali sheikh sir can you seems that he is not there right now Hey, he was there. I have seen him, but now I'm not yeah. seeing him. And yeah, this video is not on. What to do? Uh, let me check with the Ali sir. No, he is not here. Now. Ali sir is not there now. He is not there. Checking name is also saying Ali sir is not logged in. So what we will do? That we will go for a wrap up round of. take home messages of this discussion one by one and that again i will start from the panelist number 1 that we have in our order as nashim muradi sahab from afghanistan what is your suggestion and one line or two line messages to be noted for ecosystem restoration nashim sir are you here I think Nasim sir has already left. So he is mute. Sorry, I don't know whether he is. Nasim sir, if you yeah, are, he is here. Please, please switch on your video and give your one two line messages. Professor Nasim, can we have the wrap up message from your side? No. So. i'll switch on to the next atik rahman sir sir you have taken so many tasks for us and so many things you have discussed so in that cell few points that this panelist to take away sir you are required to unmute yourself unmute yourself first yeah we are not able to hear you unmute sir uh, unmute okay i'm done that yes sir please yeah. sir. okay uh i think uh, what we have to achieve in terms of ecosystemic restoration that really works is to have a well developed scientific approach with relevance to policy and the policy intermediaries in multiple ministries and systems and ecosystem and which has to include ecosystems and people so if you can do only if you want to do only ecosystem only forestry people will cut it down so you have to include the people if you want to do just water people will mess it up industries will mess kill it so it has to be those scientifically valid and rigorous policy inspired or policy induced uh, ecosystems and people so so what What, what about the development what do you do after? about this you have to take our ecosystem and environment social systems and the economic systems all these three systems together in terms of taking it further so what we need is better quality research better quality investment relevant to communities involvement of communities and addressing the right type of ecosystem in different orders of magnitude in size longevity and um the uh, services to the communities and eco- with understanding the ecosystem services so those are the buzzwords that can be integrated perfect sir thank you so much uh, your ideas are well taken but uh, still your first concern is the governance lacking so how this can be implemented so all time? that has to be done in a governance structure perfect of sir. the so, country of so, the region just not the country the, will not do it because the right nepal point. Nepal, already bhutan has become an heaven yeah but that heaven has not been translated either to nepal or to bangladesh or to india yeah that's to because of the government commitment that uh, shinge don't so that governance has to be national as well as regional yeah. looking at Each ecosystem, each community. 
Very nice, sir. So now we will have, you have already uh, named Bhutan. So turn from the Shinge Dorji, sir, to give the last few lines for us to take away. And you are one of the role model, even Atik sir also quoted you. So please, your time starts one and a half minute for you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rajesh, uh, once again uh, for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you to uh, the esteemed speakers uh, and for your kind words about Bhutan. Uh, I think uh, uh, very uh, useful uh, messages uh, are coming across uh, from this webinar and especially from Dr. Gulam's uh, presentation. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, uh, even uh, stories of, uh, you know, changes in the temperature because of afforestation. So uh, in a very short, uh, to sum it up, uh, I would like to say that, uh, you know, afforestation um, looks like uh, uh, a nature-based approach and a sustainable way uh, to achieve uh, the long-term uh, goals of uh, protecting uh, the ecosystem. And uh, some of the panelists uh, were also making uh, some very important remarks on uh, inclusive uh, development, for instance, uh, and uh, well-being, uh, I think, is coming from a lot of speakers. So uh, to conclude, uh, uh, you know, we live uh, in a, uh, a climate change uh, is a reality uh, and uh, many people are uh, facing, facing the impacts of climate change. And therefore, adaptation has become uh, necessary for many countries. So I would like to uh, wind up by saying that, uh, you know, a well-being uh, based and inclusive uh, uh, development policy uh, seems to be uh, a very important uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, countries uh, should have. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, apart from all that you have said, one very interesting thing you brought into the knowledge is the adaptation and adaptation either you align yourself according to the changing climate if you can adapt well you can survive if you cannot then darwin's theory comes survival for the fittest so again what we, i have raised in the earlier that if we want to survive for a longer time we have to be supportive to the whole of this nature we have to support otherwise nature may discard any moment and some of the issues we are looking into, if you can think about this coronavirus, maybe one of the way of elimination some human on the earth could be linked later on. We will we, and we will find that this is maybe with this link. Thank you, sir. So adaptation is another concern. Next, we are switching over to Dr. Sarla. So we are saying many more things, and I have interrupted because of the shortage of time. So again, for one and a half minutes is given to you for the Take away messages from your side, show very crispy points you can raise over here now. Thank you. It's time. Your time start now. Thank you. So I just have four things to say. One is uh, ecosystem restoration for us in India, because restoration is going to be a very aggressive uh, activity, uh, according to the government. So uh, it has to, for us in the mountains, it has to be implemented in a mountain specific way. And I think we should build on the good practices that mountain people already have. They are very good oh. practices of restoration, which good. mountain people in, uh, in India already have. And I think we, and they are all based on uh, nature-based solutions. So they use nature-based solutions to do that. And I think we should build on that. And I think in ecosystem restoration, we should remember the rights of individuals and communities. Uh, and this should be ensured because Again, we come from, if especially Northeast India, most of the land is owned by the communities or individuals. So I think these need to be ensured. And like my distinguished panelists from uh, Bangladesh said, it should be evidence-based, both research and uh, action. So it should be an evidence-based action, that means which is uh, based on uh, research and information. Thank you. Very well said, evidence-based uh, observations and the way of ecosystem restoration. You have also said one of the urban ecosystem, you have the key point well said that about the mountain people practices that you already have. So these practices should be imparted even to the urban ecosystem, whether this will work sure. over there. 
Absolutely. No, no. What I'm saying is, we already have some, you know, uh, place, place specific things are there, no, in the agro ecosystems, how the communities save that, whether it's Gadwal, whether it's Northeast India, how spring sheds have been conserved by people in Western Himalayas or in Sikkim. Perfect. So we already have these best practices. So should, we should build on that. That's what I know. Thank you so much. Arun sir, if you are around. I am around, sir. Thank you, sir. So you have to say many more things <laughs> that you have indicated in the early earlier also. So again, one and a half minute for you for takeaway messages and to be wrap over here, to be noted down, at least to put into the recommendation. Sir, your time starts now. Sure. Um, just uh, re-establishing the points I have uh, men mentioned, maybe slightly differently. You yeah. know, the, the challenges, the climate challenges, if we are really irresponsible, are definitely turning into climate crisis. We all know that. And here I think, again, the word I would repeat is, we cannot go the way we have been going into the future. And uh, that is definitely a pathway to crisis. And today I remember from my Soviet days, uh, the words of, you know, words I used to read from Frederick Engel, uh, not uh, propagating Marxism or, uh, you know, Angelism anyway in this forum, but uh, one quote uh, already always strikes in my mind. He said uh, something like, you know, for every victory we have on nature, the nature will come back and, you know, take revenge from us. And I think they, they do. So unless we go in a pathway which is very, you know, environment friendly, uh, and the way I have mentioned the greed pathway, I think we are bound to get to the crisis sooner than later. So I think we have to be very mindful and take that pathway. Thank you so much. Very well said, sir. And very, very few words, even you didn't take uh, lines of it, that eco-friendly approach and eco-friendly nature may take revenge if you are treating nature as an enemy. So one has to be very friendly. If you are friend to the nature, nature will give you the reward. Otherwise, be prepared for this and probably with this understanding, we shall be looking towards eco-friendly approaches and that only will lead to the ecosystem restoration. Well said, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And now we have Dr. Ali Takir, sir, for your views. Ali Takir, sir, are you around? Unfortunately, he is still not there. Still not there. So, can... so with this, uh, of course, we need to, from my side, it's over to Samishwar sir or Fatima ma'am, whosoever is going to take the floor. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And really, uh, we all learned, and I, for myself, I have learned a lot from these discussions and hope to have this kind of the panel discussion on some other issues some uh, another time. Thank you, Samsur sir, for giving this opportunity and uh, Ajit sir. And look forward that this Sama will really, Hindi mein kahte hai, Sama bandh dena, jo Sama hai, Suhana, gana bhi adata hai. Kuch aisa hi karenge, aap bhavish se bahut achcha dikh raha hai. So, really wish all the best to this organization. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to all the panelists. With Paul and hand, namaskar to all. Thank you very much, Professor Rajesh Kumar. But I wonder, uh, Dr. Gulam Rasool, uh, uh, Dr. Ali Sheikh Saab was there in the beginning, but uh, got disconnected. Uh, I am not sure whether you can contact him. Oh, I think you better yeah. bring it to a close. Dr. Das, uh, I want to mention one thing. Sorry, I went to the pray for yeah. God. So I came yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, the restoration uh, in the ecosystem, I want to mention that we need for uh, more cooperation from stakeholders. Yes. And also uh, the high mountain, uh, before that I was mentioned uh, uh, in the in the Kush mountain, we have a lot of people that they don't know about the uh, ecosystem, how to conserve uh, the ecosystem, how to conserve, they, they are cutting the trees and uh, destroy uh, the, the green uh, areas. Uh, uh, it is uh, first, uh, I think uh, we need for uh, cooperation of the uh, other agencies and uh, stakeholders to, to explain for those people 
what is the ecosystem, how to uh, conserve uh, the, the trees and uh, green uh, houses and uh, everything. Yeah, th thank you so so much. This is from my point. Thank you, Nasim sir. So it's well said that uh, stakeholder to be part of this all program because we are working for them, though we are working for ourselves also. They are the first victim. Later on, everybody is going to be victimized. So their involvement uh, and their awareness, their understanding is uh, well taken. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Rajesh Kumar, for conducting the panel discussion so nicely uh, in such an interesting manner. And I also like to thank all the panel members uh, from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. Unfortunately, our panel member from Pakistan probably he got disconnected uh, at the end. And also uh, in this panel discussion, we missed uh, our panel member from Myanmar uh, who could not attend. So thank you very much once again. Uh, now I hand over this to Dr. Previous Raju to give the vote of thanks. The present vote of thanks uh, will be given by Dr. Previous Raju. Yes. Raju, Very good evening, uh, respected Professor Ajit Tyagi, Chairman uh, Sama, and uh, Professor Someshwar Das, uh, Coordinator uh, of uh, Sama, and all the distinguished uh, participants. It is such a honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all the uh, designatories. On behalf of South Asian Meteorological Association, I thank uh, Dr. Gulam Rasul, Regional Program Manager, IC Mode and former Director General Pakistan Meteorological Department for his uh, excellent talk on restoration of Himalayan ecosystem despite his uh, busy schedule. I also thank uh, uh, all distinguished panel members of Hindu Kush Himalayan countries, namely Mr. Nasim Moradi, Head Forecast Afghanistan Meteorological Department, Dr. Atik Rahman, Executive Director, Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies, Dr. Singhe Dorji, Chief Weather and Climate Services Division, National Center for Hydrology and Meteorology, Royal Government of Bhutan, and Dr. Sarla Khaling, Regional Director, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, Sikkim, Dr. Arun Sesta, Regional Program Manager, uh, River Basin and the Cryosphere IC Mode, for their uh, participation in this uh, very nice panel discussions. I also thank Professor Rajesh Kumar, Dean School of Earth Sciences, Central University of Rajasthan, for his excellent moderation of today's panel discussions. I'm confident that we all got the home, home the take home message how to protect our Himalayan ecosystem. I also thank all advisory members of SAMA for their constant support and all advisors to the activities of SAMA since its inception. For special thanks to Dr. Fatima Akhtar, uh, Akhtar, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, for providing the Zoom link to organize these events. Not but not least, I thank all the EST members for their uh, wholehearted support, help, and active participation in all summer activities. Uh, and also thanks to all the participants for attending this webinar. Thank you all, and have a nice evening. Just a small thank you, thank you. comment, if you allow me. Yes. Yep, Though yes. I missed uh, Ali Sheikh Saab uh, from Pakistan to represent uh, what is happening over there and, and their views, but I really admire uh, Gulam Rasul sir has already taken care of that part and what is happening and what are the concerns. So at least uh, we have been informed with all these uh, participant countries, most of us have been informed what is happening and what are the way forward to take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And now I think uh, we should have a photo session. So yes, please, sure, sir. please sure, sir. switch on the video. Uh, please, everyone, switch on their video. Yes. Uh, yes. I see two more videos to be switched on from Myanmar. Q, Q, Shin, and Han Sui. If you are there, could you please switch on your video? Dr. Akhilesh Misra, also, I think his only profile photo is visible. He is not visible. Anyway, I think uh, uh, we can take a shot from here. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Mohan, I have taken. 
Okay, and Dr. Swagata also. <laughs> okay. I have also taken. Yeah. Great, great. I have so, I'll share. Very good. You will share. Yeah. So, thank yes, you very sir, much. Rajesh. Yes, sir. Kuch gunguna do ya? Kuch gunguna ta, sir. Sama ke liye. Sama hai suhana suhana. किसके गाना है कौन सा सर ये गाना किसका है रफी 